Q, Q is the term that's used for dynamic pressure. Right, which is which is the pressure caused caused by the uh, by the motion you know against the atmosphere. So when you're you have a vehicle and it takes off from the ground and it starts to accelerate, the air the air has inertia, the air has weight and the air pushes on the top, the front, the top of the, of the structure. Well, there's a point in the trajectory where you're accelerating quickly where, and I forget the equation for dynamic pressure, but there's a point where, you're, where the dynamic pressure becomes a maximum. And if you don't get the vehicle through that maximum dynamic pressure, what happens? It'll self-destruct, right? This, it'll buckle, it'll, be, it'll look like this. It'll, it'll be in pieces because the pressure will, will deform it and then it'll fall apart, it'll fail. So you have to get through this thing called max If you listen to like a, even like a space shuttle when they're launching and you listen to the, uh, they always have the communications, the, you know, the Capcom to, this, to the vehicle communications on the internet or whatever, they'll, they'll actually call out the point of max Q. Now, let's go back to the Iraq, Iraq war number one. Saddam Hussein bought all these Scud missiles from the Russians. They're, they're missiles, right? They just go, you know, they would go from Baghdad to Tel Aviv or something like that, or maybe not quite. You know, the, here's, here's Iraq, here's whatever other country. They couldn't quite get to the target. It was just too far. So what Hussein did is he had his engineers, they took a rocket, the Scud rocket was like this, and he said, no, wait. Or these engineers said this, no, wait, we'll just insert something in here. We'll make it look like this. We'll just insert another stage or elongate one of the stages and then that'll get us that additional range. Well, what happened to all these elongated rockets when they launched them? The things disintegrated during flight. Why? Because they did not understand the principles of max Q. So rocket science is largely a, you know, a, a trial and error thing. And unless you've seen the movie, it's not obvious how you build a successful rocket. But they didn't understand that principle. The things you can't just take something and extend it without making any corresponding, you know, changes to stiffen the structure. So now we get to the topic of how to reach orbit. As I mentioned in the beginning, being in space and being in orbit are not the same thing. One is like a thousand times more difficult than the other. <clears throat> Here's the Earth. Let's do a little cartoon. Here's the Earth. And here I am. Here we are. And we shoot a little something. Because there's gravity, right? There's gravity acting on the Earth. I'll give you the gravity explanation first, and then I'll give you the general relativity explanation second. They're both equally true and equivalent, but I'll, we'll go through both of them. It's kind of interesting. So we have gravity, right, which is, which is essentially an attractive force from the mass of the Earth to everything around it. So when I launch a bullet, a vehicle, whatever, even if I shoot it up in the air, eventually it comes back and it hits the ground. And what's the, what's the, what's the attribute that determines ultimately how far it went. Well, it's the speed that it reached, right? The faster speed I can have it go, the further range I'm gonna get, the further it's gonna go before it hits the Earth's surface again. So what if I keep accelerating my little, getting, building bigger and bigger, you know, more powerful rockets that have greater and greater speeds? And they go further and further, but they still hit the Earth's surface until one day I launch it with enough speed that it never comes back. Right, that's the one that's in orbit. Because what being in orbit effectively is, is you've launched, you've been, you've achieved the speed, right? The key is speed. 
that's the physical attribute that matters, you've achieved a speed such that you're falling, you're falling at a rate that coincides with the curvature of the Earth. And so as you fall, you just you never touch the Earth. You just fall along with it. That's what it takes to go into orbit. Now, how do we, in reality, when we launch a rocket, we have to first get through the atmosphere. So a rocket trajectory launch looks more like this. Right, we first have to get through the atmosphere, get through all that friction, and then only when we're like essentially out of the atmosphere can we start to really accelerate the vehicle to achieve that speed required. And now, what's, what is the speed to go into orbit around the Earth? It's on the, on the neighborhood, neighborhood of 17,000 miles per hour. Unless you achieve that speed, if you only reach 16,999, what's going to happen? It's going to re-enter. It's not going to stay in space. So. You have to achieve that speed. Right? The atmosphere ends here, and that's how we run it. Now, let's ask the question, where does most of that fuel go in order to get to that speed? Are we spending all of our fuel to get through the atmosphere, or are we spending it to accelerate? All the fuel comes out here. In fact, like something like, if this is like one part of the fuel, then this is like 25 parts of the fuel. So you can see the dramatic difference in how much energy it takes to, you know, fuel turns into energy, which turns into speed, to go into orbit. If you don't achieve that speed, you will not reach orbit. Now, we'll talk about how to, how to, how to escape Earth later, right? There's a, you know, orbital speed is not the same as escape velocity. If you want to go to the moon, Saturn, Mars, anything else, you have to achieve escape velocity. We'll talk about that probably in another video. That's a little bit faster because at escape velocity, what you have to do is you have to, you have to go, you have to have enough energy to essentially outrun the total potential energy of the entire gravitational field to infinity. Now, you don't go to infinity, but you have to have more energy than the potential energy total of the Earth's gravitational field to infinity. Whereas to reach orbit, all you have to do, you only merely have to accelerate to 17,000 miles per hour in order to achieve a, a rate of falling that corresponds to the curvature of the Earth. Right? If the Earth were square, then you'd have to go faster to get around the corners. Right? <laughs> so, um, a little attempt at rocket science humor. So, that's the uh, gravitational explanation. Now let's talk about f being in orbit. Now let's talk about it from a... Well, first let's talk about weightlessness. If you are dropped in orbit, right, this, this is not real, re realistically possible. If you were just dropped in orbit, would you all of a sudden be weightless, right? Just by virtue of being above the atmosphere, does that make you weightless? It does not, right? You still have mass. You still have inertia. There's less gravity. But there's not no gravity, right? Just because the atmosphere went away, gravity did not go away. So weightlessness is really just being in a free fall. In this case, it's a free fall that never intersects the Earth. In the case of a ballistic trajectory, right, there's a certain time here when the thing is reaching the top where you're essentially in a free fall inside the vehicle, right? the, the, the so-called vomit comet that NASA runs. They do a, they do a trajectory using there. It used to be a uh, KC-135, I think. I don't know what it is now. Uh, that doesn't even go outside the atmosphere, but they run this profile, par parabolic profile, at the top, relative to these, the space, you know, the the vehicle you're in, you're weightless, right? You don't, you're not, you could be floating because you're in a free fall state. The same thing in an elevator. If you had an elevator that descended at this, you know, at the same rate as a gravitational acceleration, I don't, to my knowledge, nobody has ever built us an elevator like that. It would be kind of a freaky experience when you wanted to like get off, stop at a floor. A free fall situation. So weightlessness is just free fall. The same as when you jump off the high dive, jump, you know, do cliff diving or whatever. So that's the, the gravitational analogy. <clears throat> now, the theory of general relativity from Einstein says says that matter, right, mass 
creates curvature in space-time. So around the, here's the Earth, which has a, a lot of mass. We have space-time is curved around Earth. And so now the term, what is the proper term? I think I'm going to use the term world line, Which is sort of like you're if you're just like a if you're just out there in space time in the presence of this your world line is just the path that you would normally take because the Earth is here and it curves space time my world line is curved and the problem is that my curved world line gets interrupted by the Earth itself so gravity is really just the effect of the Earth getting in the way of me realizing my curved world line. So if I'm not touching the Earth, I'm just pursuing my world line, which is a curved path, and that's the same thing as being in orbit. You just have to get to a point where that's where the Earth no longer interferes with you. So that's another way to look at being in orbit. Okay, I think I could go on here endlessly. I'm going to stop and I'll resume uh, shortly with, with the remainder of this curriculum, and then we'll get into the question of what are you actually going to do when you reach orbit. I hope you find this interesting. If you have any comments, send them to solve at midnighttutor.com.